restored. He just performed a miracle again. And it's the same miracle he's done years before, but I have made a mistake that separates me from him. And in that moment, he had to make a decision. Do I go closer to him? Or do I stay back? Do I swim to the shore and run to his feet? Or do I fall away? Do I throw to the other side of the lake and try to avoid his gaze as best as I can? And in that moment, Peter realized that the better decision that he could possibly make than anything else in that moment, despite every mistake he'd made in the past, despite every false word or every, every failed attempt to please his God, he realized at that moment that the only position he could take was to run to his Father, was to run to Jesus. What position are we taking today? Where do we stand with Jesus? Are we avoiding his gaze or are we running to his feet? Are we falling at the feet of the Savior or are we trying to, to escape his, his, his eyes? Think to you a moment, think for a moment where you are. What is holding you back from him? What is keeping you away from him? What do you believe is separating you from his love? Because my word tells me that nothing can separate you from his love. The only one who can separate you from his love is you. Run to the Father today. Run to him. Fall at his feet. Stretch out your hands this morning. Stretch your hands towards heaven.
praise and out of worship. And we're going to start to transition into the word. I believe there's a couple things we want to do before that. But this morning I pray that as much as I as, as much as I ever have, I pray that you don't walk out of here the same as when you walked in. Do not miss God this morning. He wants to change somebody's life. He wants to change somebody's life this morning. to you in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. God, we just love you. And then this morning, we just, uh, we, we thank you for, for all the moms and for those who um, who just fill that, that motherly role in our lives, God. And Lord, I, I pray a special blessing on you today. And, and Lord, uh, I just thank you so much that they're here. I thank you, Lord, that even though it, it's a day about them, that it, it's a day about you. And Lord, I pray that you would just put all of our cares aside. Help us to focus on you this morning. I pray, Lord, that I would speak the words that you have your people to, to hear this morning. I pray that the words would go into their ears and into their minds and into their spirits, that they would be changed, that they would never, ever be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So, does anyone have a favorite book of the Bible? Proverbs. With grace? Proverbs. Proverbs. All right. Anyone else? Any favorite books? Philippians. Philippians. Acts. I love Acts. Act. What, Miss Bobby? John. Yeah. All right. So, I. Uh, I love Acts. Like Acts is like my, my favorite book of the Bible because like it's all about the, the early church and you know the Holy Spirit fell and there's all these miracles and, and like it's like a, a fast moving and it's just like a super super exciting book. My favorite book. Um, 
Now, I know everyone is holy and doesn't really have books that they don't like. Because, you know, all Bibles, the inspired word of God. And, and so we, we don't like, no one dislikes any of them. But if you had to choose one that was not your favorite, not your favorite. What was that? Numbers, yeah. All of, there's a lot of numbers in that book. All, all, all the counting. All right? Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, yeah. Yeah. Come on. Le Leviticus. All right. And any others? Leviticus. Leviticus, yeah. Leviticus, yeah. That one, that one, that one can be a, a little tough, too, you know? Um, so I have, like... I, I have books that I don't like as much as others, but I also have like sections that have never really been my favorite. And and I know um, some of you are going to think I'm a little irrational on this one, but one of my least favorite chapters of the Bible is Proverbs 31. Yeah, I know, I know that makes me a terrible person, doesn't it? It was like. You know all about the, the Proverbs 31 woman? And like, but for me, whenever I've heard teachings on Proverbs 31, I've always kind of left feeling inadequate instead of empowered. And like, I read it, and I was like, like, who does this stuff? You know, like this poor woman, she must be exhausted from doing all of these things. Like, how can I ever measure up? to the Proverbs 31 woman. Well, this year, as I was, I hadn't even really started diligently praying about my message. I just started like thinking about it. And as soon as I started thinking about it, God spoke to my heart and he said, speak on Proverbs 31. <laughs> and of course I dismissed it because, you know, who wants to preach on something that makes you feel inadequate you know and so um i i prayed about it and then every time i thought about it i was god just spoke to my heart he said proverbs 31 and so i said okay god and I, I started reading it and, and god showed me some some things that i had not seen in proverbs 31 before so um today i am speaking on proverbs 31 but my goal for you today is to leave here empowered. I don't want you to feel uh, like, like you will never measure up, but I want you to leave here feeling empowered. Um, I don't want you to, to play that comparison game. You know, oftentimes uh, as women, we compare ourselves to other people. And, and men do this too, but, but not really in the same way. Um, but we look at someone's highlight reel on, on Facebook or on Instagram, and we see their lives and we think like, like, like I, I could never do that stuff. Like, like look at that woman, she, she's just so beautiful, and she's there with her family, and all of her children are looking at the camera, and like my kids, like, like how, do, how do you even get all these children to look at the camera at the same time? I, you know, I, I do like now though, a lot of times people post like, their, their, their nice family picture, and then they post the before to let you know, okay, it took a lot of tries to get this. But, but we, we look at the after, and we like, man, how, how is it, how did it, they all match, there's no juice spilled out anyone, you know, and, and she's looking longingly into her husband's eyes, and, and you're like, oh, my husband, does it be like that? You know, you know, the photographer told him to. But, you know, you think about their lives and, oh, she must want the perfect marriage and, you know, they're on a beach in Hawaii and you think, oh, I wish I could go to Hawaii. I'm just sitting here on the bank of the James River, right? And, and, and we compare ourselves. We compare ourselves to others. Well, if you go to Facebook's About page, it states their purpose. And it says, Facebook builds technologies that gives people the power to connect with friends and family, find, find 
communities and grow businesses. And this is the main reason that most of us use Facebook or any other social media, right? To connect with others. Well, in 2015, uh, Barnard uh, sampled women age 18 and over, and they found that the greatest benefits of social media, according to these women, are relational. 51% said um, it was to stay up to date with family and friends. 41% say it makes them feel connected uh, to friends. Less important are um, utilitarian benefits like uh, finding inspiration or ideas, 21%, learning new things, also 21%. And this one kind of uh, made me chuckle a little bit. Uh, stay encouraged on news and world events, 20%. Um, so yes, Facebook, I guess, is a, a according to 20% of women 18 and older, a great way to find out um, news. <laughs> Yeah. But there's also a negative side to the survey. Uh, the most common negative impacts of social media use relate to wasting time. 38% of women 18 and over say it is a time waster. 27% uh, say that it distracts them from work or other things uh, they need to do. Yeah, I've never been distracted on social media. Have you? Yeah. Only 27%. Um, and one in seven women, 14%, admit to judging other people. Uh, that's a negative impact of using social media, uh, not being present to those physically around them, 13%, and comparing themselves to others, 12%. Those are also other negative impacts of social media use. Um, now, almost half of all women, 49%, next slide please, say that they feel bored either usually or sometimes after using social media. Another third, 35%, report wanting to change something about their lives. 24% feel like they're missing out on something. 21%, almost one in, uh, just over one in five women, report feeling lonely. And 17% say they feel jealous of other people's lives. You know, we all have feelings of inadequacy sometimes. But it appears that social media tends to make this worse in some people. Let me tell you a story. I love stories. Yeah. Y'all like stories? Yeah. I love stories. Um, when I first had children, I quit my job to be a stay-at-home mom. Well, the problem is I had no idea how to really run a household. I looked to other mothers to kind of see what they did to be successful, and I would try to model some of what they did. Now, over the years, I made some changes and I tried some new things. Some of those things were successful and they worked really well, but others didn't work so well and um, they just weren't very successful. One of those things was ironing. <laughs> this is my nemesis. <laughs> my mother, on the other hand, is the queen of ironing. My mother loves to iron. When I was an infant, she would iron all of my baby clothes. Yes, all of my baby clothes. And then when I got older, mom went back to school, she became a nurse, and every morning, my mom was up at 5.15, and you would find her in the kitchen, ironing <clears throat> her scrubs every day before she went to work. Now, like I said, I hated ironing. I still do. When I would iron the front of a pair of pants, the back would get creased, right? When I'd iron the back to try to get the crease out, I'd flip them over, only to discover that now the front had a crease in it and it was back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Besides, like, when you wear a pair of pants for a while, like, I mean, they're gonna get wrinkled anyways, right? So I kind of felt like, 
like with what's the use? Um, laundry is okay. I, I don't mind laundry. I kind of like laundry, but like ironing, I kind of think of that as like my thorn in the flesh. Okay. <laughs> well, one is it? One day when my children were young, I decided I was going to master ironing. At the time, Pastor John was an executive with a large construction company, and he wore dress shirts almost every day. And on laundry day, every Monday, I would wash his dress shirts, and I would spend hours ironing them, trying to get them exactly right. But they were never really right. And like, I knew how to do it, you know, like you start with the collar, you start with the small parts, and then you like do the bigger parts, and you know, you do the front and the back parts. Like, I know that, okay? But I had my spray starch, and, and I, I, you know, I, I knew how to do it. My mom taught me how to do it, but they were never really right. Well, Pastor Sean would come home from work, and I'd show him the shirts, that I proudly ironed for him, and he'd look at them, and he would lie to me, and he would tell me, wow, honey, those look really great. But then he would remind me of the dry cleaners up the road <laughs> who would launder them, starch them, and iron them for a dollar a shirt. A dollar. But I was determined I was going to do this. Because in my mind, this was part of being a good wife to my husband. No one had mandated this to me. Don't think, don't go to Pastor Sean and say, I heard you made your white iron shirts. No, he didn't, okay? This was in my mind, this is what I thought it meant to be a good wife. So every week I would wash his dress shirts and I would iron them. And every week, Pastor Shaw would come home and he'd tell me they look great. And then he would remind me about the dry cleaners up the road that would do them for a dollar a shirt. Now, after many months of torture, I caved. And I took his shirts to the dry cleaners, and when I picked them up two days later, they looked beautiful. They were clean, they were starched, and they were well ironed. Like you could hold his dress shirt like on the floor and let it go and it would just stand there by itself. <laughs> Not a wrinkle to be seen. From that point on, I would drop his shirts off at the dry cleaners every Monday and I would go back every Wednesday and I would hand them a five dollar bill and in exchange they would hand me five shirts that were clean and starched and impeccably ironed. I was not aggravated, and my husband was happy. You see, I was setting an expectation for myself based on what someone else was doing. And that wasn't right, nor was that healthy. Today, Pastor Sean pulls out his clothes for Sunday on Saturday night, and he irons them himself. And when he does, he looks at me and he says, hey, do you need anything ironed for Sunday? Did you see my pants today, how beautiful they look? <laughs> yeah. Yay. You are applauding for Pastor Sean because I did not iron these. Okay? My, my husband ironed them for me um, actually this morning. So when you see him, you tell him what a good job he did. Now, I can iron. I, I, I can do it, but I don't like it. And I really, I'm not very good at it. I've never really mastered my skill of ironing. And you know what? That's okay. It's okay. In preparation for my message today, like I said, I was reading through Proverbs 31. And God showed me that it's not about what I can do or what I can't do. It's about who I am. God doesn't care if I can perfectly honor my shirt. God cares about my character. And this morning, we're going to take a look at six strengths of the Proverbs 31 woman. 
but we can see these character strengths through some of the things that she does. And fun fact, Proverbs 31 says nothing about laughing. Not one line. Now, men, don't tune me out today. I know it's Mother's Day. I know we're talking about Proverbs 31, but we're talking about character. And so character can be applied to you as well. These are not strictly women traits. So if you turn to Proverbs 31 in your Bible, um, you will see that these are not the words of a man setting lofty expectations. These are the words of a mature woman. They're the, they're the words of a mother who wants the best for her son. Her son who just happens to be the king. The first nine verses of this chapter, she gives him advice for his life. Words that we can all live by. Proverbs 31.1 begins, The words of King Lemuel, the utterance which his mother taught him. What, my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert justice of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink, forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open your mouth to the speechless in the cause for all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. You see, the king's mother is talking to him about women, intoxicating drink, and standing up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. And this is great advice for any person, not just for a king. Concerning a wife, she's speaking to his life, reminding him of the qualities that he should be considering uh, when he's looking for someone to spend his life with. And I did the same for my children. When they were growing up, we would talk about um, the couples that we knew and what about them made them a good spouse or a bad spouse and then as they grew older we would look at some of their friends and uh and other people that they knew who weren't necessarily their friends and we'd say hey you know look at joe over there what makes him a, a, a good what would make him a good spouse and what would make him not so good for spouse and sometimes there was people that they didn't really like. And I'd say, so who would make them a spouse? And they'd say, nothing. Nothing would make them a good spouse. They're a terrible person. I was like, no, they have some redeeming qualities. Let's look deep and let's really look at their character, what's driving their behavior. And I would have these conversations with my children so that as they grew up and they were getting ready to look for a spouse, they knew what to look for. And if we look at verse 3, we can read the mother's warnings that the wrong woman will steal his strength. So he must choose carefully. So number one, character strength is be encouraging. Do not steal your husband's strengths. Do not emasculate him. Do not deprive him of his identity as a man. Do not make him feel weak or ineffective. You are to encourage him. And men, same thing. Do not make your wife feel degraded. Do not demean her or dishonor her. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it reads, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. That word help or helper in the Hebrew is azer, spelled E-Z-E-R. And it means to surround in order to protect or to aid, to help. And we usually think protection as more of a manly quality, isn't it? But here, God calls you, wife, woman, a helper. This same word, azair, is found in Psalms 121, verses 1 and 2. 
and it reads, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You see, a helper can be someone less educated or less skilled. Like, for instance, one summer, my son uh, Noah came home and uh, he was looking for work and, and Bobby Blair hired him uh, as a helper for his HVAC business. Now, obviously, Noah, never working in HVAC, um, was less educated in that field than, than Bobby was. However, he was able to help him moving the units, doing errands, changing parts, things like that. Um, I know uh, Josh uh, cuts down trees on his property and Mason, Will, and Olivia will come and help him drag trees. Um, now, that doesn't mean that Josh really needs their help, right? Mason and Olivia are three and four, right? And so, so Josh doesn't need their help, but they're helping. So that's one way we can use help. But a helper can also be someone more educated or more skilled, like a tutor. About 10 years ago, I was a volunteer at uh, Wayne Community College in, in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and my job was to work with students who were working toward uh, their GED because they needed some help. Often they wouldn't understand something and they needed a helper. They needed someone who knew the material and could teach them. That was me. I was their helper. Yes, God created woman to be a helper, but that doesn't have a negative connotation to it. You see, God made you for your husband because he knew on his own he was insufficient for the task. He needed someone to help him. And that someone was you. As a wife, your job is to be a helper and is there to your husband, to surround him, to protect him, to aid him, and to help him. So what are some things that you can protect him from? You can protect him from the fiery darts of the enemy through your prayers. One of the most valuable ways you can help your husband is to pray for him. I know um, some of you may have read Stormy O. Martin's book, The Power of a Praying Wife, um, you know, just filled with things and ideas about how you can pray for your husband. You can protect him from the hurtful words of others. You can, by standing up for him, you can help him from exhaustion or from burnout. Hey, honey, you've been working really hard. I think you need a day off. Let's take a day and go to the beach. Let's take a day and just chill out at home. Let's take a day and just watch a movie. Let's take a day and let's just be together. You can protect him from making poor decisions. You can protect him from forming bad relationships. You can protect him from feelings of inadequacy. We can also protect our husbands from themselves, right? Um, you ever watch those, uh, like the, the fail army on TV <laughs> or yeah. Okay. Mostly guys age like 12 to 25, right? There's a reason for that. Um, men who are married live longer. They have, uh, they report, uh, better quality of lives because they have someone there with them. They have something protect, they have someone protecting them. They have someone saying, uh, you know, that doesn't look real good. Maybe you should go to the doctors. No, I'm fine. Pastor Sean's famous words, I'm fine. Right? I know no one else's husband says I'm fine. Right? Just mine? Um, but we can protect them from many other things as well. But you see, women so often in our efforts to help our husbands, we steal their strength and we emasculate them. See, your job is to encourage them, but not make them feel weak. 
or ineffective. You see, when I tutored students, much of what I did was to build their confidence. I would teach them what they needed to know, and then I would cheer them on when they got it right, and when they got it wrong, I would just teach them again. I never called them stupid. I never put them down. I encouraged them, and eventually, they would get it. My job was to partner with them to help them to be successful and to pass the test. That's the same job I have at home, to partner with my husband to help him to be successful. I do this through encouraging him, through completing the tasks that I need to do so that he doesn't have to worry about it. I do it through cooperating with him in making decisions. I don't do this by demeaning him, putting him down, by making him feel stupid. By ignoring his requests or taking control of decisions and doing whatever I want without considering him. And that's what the king's mother was trying to tell him here in verse 3. Do not allow a woman to steal your strength. She should help you by encouraging you, but not demean you or make you feel like less than a man. So number one character strength, be encouraging. If we continue reading, you'll see in verse 10 uh, begins the section known as the virtuous woman or the virtuous wife. And this is the main quality of her character. She is virtuous. Proverbs 31, verse 10 and 12 reads, Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Virtuous means having or showing high moral standards. So men, you also need to be virtuous. You also need to have high moral standards. In place of the word vir virtuous, other versions of the Bible use the word noble, excellent, capable, or intelligent. Verse 10 tells us that a virtuous woman is valuable, more valuable than rubies, a precious stone. Verse 11 says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She's not overspending. She's not out maxing out the credit cards. She's careful in her spending and her investing. Verse 12 says, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. You see, a virtuous wife is good to her husband. She helps him. She protects his interests. She builds him up so that he can be the man that God has called him to be. Men, same thing. Build up your wife so she can be the woman that God has called her to be. Verse 13 through 16 are support scriptures exampling how this wife is virtuous, how she is noble, excellent, capable or intelligent. Proverbs 31 verse 13 through 16 reads, she seeks woolen flax, she willingly works with her hands, she is like the merchant ships, she brings her food from afar, she also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservant. She considers a field and she buys it and from her profits she plants a vineyard. Now, I doubt many of you in here today are out seeking wool or flax. However, you are working with your hands either at a job in the home or outside the home. I doubt many of you are bringing food from afar, from afar or getting up at night to prepare breakfast for uh, your household and for your maid servants, right? You're probably not buying fields or, or planting vineyards. However, you might be using a curbside pickup at Food Lion so that you can ensure that you have groceries in your home. The 
the cultural details of this passage, they are her specific roles for her culture. But we live in a different era. So the principles of what she's doing are the same. The principles are timeless. This woman is virtuous because she has high moral standards. She is trustworthy, she is good to her husband, and she is taking care of her family. So our number two characteristic was be virtuous. Number three, be diligent. Proverbs 3.17, she girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. The NIV says she sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. The New Living says she is energetic and strong, a hard worker. The Amplified says she girds herself, she girds herself with strength, spiritual, mental, and physical fitness for her God-given tasks and makes her arms strong and firm. Verse 18 to 22 are the support verses showing us examples of the things that she is doing. Beginning in verse 18, it reads, she perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. You see, her arms are strong because she's used to working with her arms. She's washing clothes and scrubbing them and she's hanging them up and she's picking produce and, and she's spinning wool and she's sewing. You see, her body is fit enough to do the tasks she needs to do because she does those tasks every day. I love this section, like all of the, look at all the verbs in this section, all these action words. Uh, perceives, stretches, extends, reaches, and makes. Like this woman's, she's got it going on. She is diligent to make sure the things she needs to do are getting done. Verse 18 and 19 are all about her working hard at her responsibilities. Verse 20 and 21 are all about her working to help others. And verse 22 is about making things for herself because she wants to. She's able to do this because she has diligently managed her time. These verses are not telling us that we need to work long into the night spinning wool. Spinning wool. Because if they did, I would be failing miserably. But they are saying that we should be working hard to complete the tasks that we need to do and we should, to the best of our ability, keep not just our bodies fit, but also our souls fit and our spirits fit enough to do the work that God has called us to do. Number four character strength, be supportive. Proverbs 31, 23 reads, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And the support verses are verse 24 and 25. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. In the Bible, the city gates represented a place of significance. It was a place where the kings gave decrees to the people, where armies were commanded for war, where important governmental and societal business took place. Townspeople came and went, they bought and sold, and they were tried and executed. Most of a town's civic life was centered on the town gate complex. In essence, the city gate was like the town square of culture in biblical times. 
The reason her husband is known at the city gates is because she has been doing business with the people there and has been getting to know them. She's made connections for him, but not just because of her buying and her selling. Look at verse 25 there. He's also known because her strength and honor are her clothing. You see, people don't just do business with her because of the clothing that she sells. They do business with her because she is clothed with strength and with honor. I'm sure you've heard the saying before, behind every good man is a good woman. And this is certainly the case here. She has made her husband a better man. Are you the type of woman who makes your husband a better man? I heard a story one time about the president and the first lady, and they were traveling back to her hometown, and they had just gotten off Air Force One, and they got into a limousine and were traveling back to the first lady's homestead. And as they were traveling back, they needed gas. They were almost home, so they stopped at just one of those old little gas stations in the first lady's hometown. And they were sitting in the limo, and she noticed uh, the gentleman pumping her gas was her high school sweetheart. So she was so excited to see him, she hops out of the, the limousine and starts talking with him, and just talking about, you know, the, the good times back in the day. She, you know, said, hey, you know, we're, we're home, we're at the old homestead for, for a couple days, come by and see us, you know, we'd love to catch up. And uh, they, it was time to go, so she got back in the limousine and the president holds on to her hand and she says, you know, it was so good to see him. I, you know, he, he's been a, a, a good friend to me over the years. And the president looks at her and says, yeah, but did you ever think where you would be if you married him instead of me? And she looks at him and says, yes, I would be sitting in the car with the President of the United States. You see, she realized that her husband could never have achieved what he achieved without her behind him, encouraging him, and urging him to be the best man he could. He couldn't be the man he was without her support. And that's so important. Ladies, you have such an influence over the lives of your husband. And it's you who he needs to cheer him on, to be his support so that he can be who God has called him to be. Number five character strength is be wise and kind. Proverbs 31, 26 reads, she opens her mouth with, with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. The New Living says when she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She thinks before she speaks. She doesn't lash out with her words. She's not crass. Verse 27 supports this. It reads, she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Because she has wisdom and kindness, she is not idle. She's constantly watching over her household. She knows what her husband's doing. She knows what her children are doing. A wise, a wise wife diligently pays attention to her surroundings and corrects things that she sees that are wrong. Verse 28 and 29 is a result of these qualities. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel the all. At the end of the day, her children are proud to call her mom, and her husband is proud to call her his wife. If 
men and ladies, if you want the accolades of your spouse and your family, you must think before you speak. We do this so we can speak wise words. We do this so we don't speak hurtful words. We need to make sure that we are speaking the words that God gives us, especially in times of conflict. I'm sure none of you here have ever had an argument with your spouse or an argument with your children, but I have. And I know that sometimes there are words that you want to say that you shouldn't. And sometimes those words come out. And once they're out, you can never take them back. It's so important that we watch what we're saying to our spouse and to our children. We need to make sure that our words are wise, that we're, we're asking God, God, you know, give me the words to say. I have a, a friend who was um, talking to her, her teenage daughter recently, and her daughter was hurt because she felt like the mom gave all this help to other people, but never helped her. And the mom wanted to come back and say, yeah, but I did this and this and this and this and this for you. How can you say I don't help you more than I help everyone else? She's a minister. But as she sat on the side of her bed, she was silent. And then she said, you're right. I'm sorry. Because that is what her daughter needed to hear. And sometimes we need to think what is more important. Is it more important that I am right? Or is it more important that I am speaking kind words that's going to build someone? Speak wise words. Speak the words that God gives you. And speak them kindly. And the number six character strength is love God. This is one final word of advice from the mother of the king to her son. Proverbs 31.30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Every young man wants a beautiful wife. But you see, that's not really what's most important, is it? What is important is that she loves God. Quite a few years ago, I was out with another Christian woman for a day, and she was a, a leader in her church. And uh, we swung through a, a fast food drive through for, for a drink, and she pointed out that handsome young man in the window of that drive through And she shared with me that she had been talking to her daughter about that young man, trying to persuade her to get to know him, maybe form a relationship with him. And I asked her the same question that I asked my kids. Does he love Jesus? And she looked at me kind of surprised and really a little bit embarrassed. And she said, no, I don't know. And I urged her to consider how much more important that was that he loved Jesus than what he looked like on the outside. And you know, really she, she knew this, but she wasn't putting it into practice and she certainly hadn't been portraying it to her children. This is so, so important. Like, like this here, everything else hangs on us. As I said before, I talked to my children when they were growing up about their future spouse. This wasn't my idea. This was a, a friend's idea who had um, 
children who were already grown and, and out of the house. And she was a woman who spoke to my life quite quite a bit. And so I, I started doing this when uh, I don't know, my kids were probably nine or ten. And um, I I had conversations with my kids, you know, deep conversations about this. Do they know Jesus? What's their walk like? What's their prayer, prayer life like? This was my number one requirement for my kids. You see, good looks will not build a healthy marriage. They won't pay the bills. They won't sustain you during difficult times. However, if both you and your spouse love God, and commit to serve him all the days of your lives, you will be unstoppable. And you will be unstoppable because everything you do will be successful because God is leading both of you to do those things and to do those things together. This here is the most important one. Love God. You know, I talk about being wise and kind. And think about, gee, are those words that I'm about to speak, are they words Jesus would speak? Are they wise and kind? It all comes back to this. Um, I encourage you all to consider not just these character strengths. Uh, we talked about being encouraging, being virtuous, being diligent, be supportive, be wise and kind, and love God. Um, but there are some resources you all know I like to read. Um, and I brought two books today for you to look at. Um, full disclosure, I have not finished either of them yet, but so far so good. Um, the first one is The Jesus Hearted Woman by Jody Dietrich. Um, I have many Christian friends. I see Becky nodding her head. Good book. I know her. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so so you, have you read this one? Okay. Um, you can borrow it from them if you want. But um, I have many friends. This is on their top ten list. Okay. Um, it's it's a, a great book. Uh, 10 Leadership Qualities for Enduring and Endearing Influence. And it says leadership qualities, but don't think that this book isn't for you if you're not a leader in the church or you're not a leader at your job because you're leading someone. You're leading your families. You're leading people outside of your family who look to you. Um, so that's the first one, The Jesus Hearted Woman by Jody Dietrich. And the second one I just started, um, it is uh, by John Maxwell, uh, The 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader. And again, it is a leadership book. However, you are leading someone. And at the very least, you're leading yourself. And these are all... Um, character qualities, um, easy read, little book. Each chapter is like six pages. So you can read it in like, you know, five minutes, maybe 10 if you're a, a slower reader, but easy, easy read. Um, so I recommend uh, both of you, both of those books to you as well. Um, AJ, if, if you'll come, with, with the band, um, and y'all know that I usually like to, well, I always like to give all of the ladies a gift when you leave on Mother's Day, and um, my, my gift that I give is, isn't something trivial, it's, it's something to help you to remember uh, what you learned today. And so today I have these bags for you as you go, um, I think Mike, you have those. Yep. And 
and uh, Jim has those and they'll each be at a door uh, when you leave, they'll hand you one of these, but these are um, little tote bags and they say she is clothed in strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. And this is our, our point number four today about being supported. And on the bottom it says Proverbs 31 and 5, so you'll have those when you go today. Um, my, my prayer is that as you, as you leave today, that you, would, um, that you would remember that. That you would remember that you are clothed in strength and you are clothed in dignity. Because that is who God calls you to be. You know, I talk about these, these qualities um, and character strengths from the Proverbs 31 woman. And God has given you the ability to walk in all of those. He has given you the, the ability to, to be who he has called you to be. And so I hope that this is just a, a nice reminder of that for you. So um, let, let me pray. And as, as the band sings, if you would like to just kind of reflect on those. Um, and um, let's pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I just pray that you would just seal this word in our hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would remind us of the character strengths from the Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, Lord, not that we need to measure up to her or compare ourselves to her and, and, the, and the things that she did, Lord, but that we would want to build character strengths in ourselves whether we're a man or a woman of God, because it's it's the character of our heart that you care about. It's We know, Lord, that if we build character within us, that it will come out outwardly. And that through our, our character, Lord, that people would look at us different, that they would know we are yours by our outward actions. We pray as we go this week that you would... Um, Give us someone to share with, letting them know how very good you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Stand up to your feet. Let's go play one more song. Let's give God a little bit of praise this morning before we end it.
Thank you. 